This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, David Papineau, who is a professor of philosophy at King's College London, also the author of uh, a number of books. Um, uh, most recent book is The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience. He's written a couple of books on, on consciousness, uh, called, one called Thinking About Consciousness, one called Introducing, uh, Introduction, to, was it Introduction to Consciousness? Introducing Consciousness. Uh, Introducing. And then um, Introducing Consciousness. Then you've got this graphic guide <laughs> on consciousness with lots of, lots of pictures. It's the only picture book I know that is about uh, consciousness. Uh, you, you've edited this, I guess, which this, this is sort of a, a textbook for, um, I don't know whether this yeah. is a college, introductory college. It's a... Um, uh, philosophy theories and, and great thinkers where you're the editor. Um, then this one, which is also, uh, I think has to be used as a, as a textbook in, in a number of classes called, uh, philosophical devices. And then this more popular book called, uh, knowing the score, what sports can teach us about philosophy and what philosophy can teach us about sports. Uh, welcome David. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. I'm glad to be here. Well, I think we're going to start by talking uh, about sports um, because, you know, philosophy is oftentimes seen as a, as a very um, esoteric discipline, one that is, at least in today's world, restricted to the, the academy. And, and I think, you know, the point of knowing the scorebook is to show that, well, you know, you can apply philosophy to, to pretty much anything, <laughs> right, in, including uh, things like sports, which to some people is, you know, it's it's kind of a non-serious activity, right? And I think, I think you're trying to make it clear that, you know, you think that this is as serious as any other <laughs> uh, human activity, yeah. but, it, but it also gives you an opportunity to explore exactly what are the boundaries of philosophy. And, and what I found is that, you know, for me, it was interesting is that you, you, you talk about game theory and, and you, you, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's economics in there. I mean, the, 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 the boundary between philosophy and these other disciplines is, is not, uh, very, very clear at all. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, I found that with the philosophical devices, you know, the, the topics in here, yeah. I didn't realize, you, you said that this is really the topics that are central to the concerns of philosophers at this point. And I'm reading it and I'm like, wait, this is the kind of stuff that I teach in my introductory data and decisions class. And some of the stuff is the stuff I teach in my, you know, introductory um, mm -hmm. critical thinking class. Um, and, and so, you know, is do do people sort of ordinary ordinary thinking people do do we need to rethink philosophy and kind of domesticate it you know bring it into realize that that what we're doing is we are philosophizing right whether we whether we, you know it's just like we're, we're we're speaking prose right remember in in uh, in Moliere yeah. it's like oh I'm speaking prose are we are we doing philosophy all the time. <laughs> Yes, if you follow the argument where it takes you, you're likely to be doing philosophy. I mean, I have a a view about philosophy, what philosophy is. Maybe not all my colleagues would share it, but quite a, quite a lot do. Where I don't think of philosophy as having a a special subject matter. Uh, I, I I think of philosophy as a kind of set of techniques, a, a, a way of proceeding that that you need to adopt when you meet a certain kind of problem and you can meet the problem in any any area of thought or life i mean the problem is when 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 you discover that your thinking is leading you into paradox you've got assumptions that uh, uh contradict each other and uh you know some of them must be wrong because reality doesn't contradict itself so you've got to figure out where the mistakes coming from and often it will be due to ideas you didn't even know you had implicit assumptions uh, uh so i don't know what would be a, an, an illustration um um philosophical problems can arise arise anywhere uh, hey look so you're thinking about about the mind and you know do you have a soul i mean i suppose that looks like a philosophical topic but uh but then, you know, you think, well, I just think about my own consciousness. It's obvious that I'm not just a physical machine. But then you think, uh, but all my bodily movements are due to what's going on in my brain. And uh, so if the consciousness is different from the brain, it doesn't have any influence on what I do. And 
and then suddenly you've got yourself into a philosophical philosophical problem and it's not quite clear what the right thing to think is and uh, I mean this can arise in all areas of science uh, I'm uh, anyway now my current project is about the nature of causation and how we find out about it and if you think about what statisticians and econometricians do they they look at at correlations the way things tend to vary probabilistically with each other and then they draw some conclusion about this causes that, but we think of causation as a deterministic thing, that one thing forces another to happen. So how come the same thing is both probabilistic and deterministic, and uh, and now you've got a philosophical problem? But not everybody wants to follow the issue through. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I can imagine a lot of economists would say, would say, you know, yeah, yeah, but look, we, we can see that these techniques looking at probability is a pretty good way of doing it let's not worry too much about why let's just get ahead get ahead and calculate so it's not given to everybody I and mean, i don't know if to put it that way around it's not everybody is is uh is burdened with the need to carry on following the argument through but uh well, quite a few lot of people uh, have that inclination they end up doing philosophy classes and enjoying them some of them go on to be philosophers well you know Certainly, there there are some, uh, I guess, practical people who uh, dismiss philosophy as nothing more than a game, and 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 they may also dismiss a sport as as nothing more than than a game, uh, and you know these two things. I, I think y you have uh, played a lot of sport in your life. Uh, you know, you played cricket and and other sports, uh, uh, tennis, and so forth, and. You know, when I was, I was reading about your experience as mm -hmm. an athlete, as a participant in amateur sports, it made me think, for most people, a team of philosophers out there on the cricket pitch, I mean, this sounds like a Monty Python skit, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, philosophers aren't typically mm -hmm. known for their their mm -hmm. sporting ways. Um, you know, how do you respond to somebody who, who says that, um, well, you know, sport is 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 kind of superfluous it's just uh you know recreation and uh to the extent that it might have value it might have value in that it maybe helps you achieve fitness or you know pursue some other more serious uh or important goal i i just re reject the idea that sport is just recreation or amusement uh I think that, that that wanting to develop physical skills and hone them and uh, admire people who have high levels of physical skill, that's just perfectly natural to human beings. I mean, I guess there there are people who who aren't interested in that kind of thing, but there are people who aren't interested in philosophy that people aren't interested in music not everybody has to be interested in everything but I, I i don't think one needs any special excuse to explain why sport is valuable it's, i mean it's just the the development and celebration admiration of others doing it of of extreme physical skill and it's a wonderful thing it's something to admire uh, so uh uh i i i i just don't think that sport is is unimportant i mean you know somebody devote, devotes their life to to baseball seems to me no less serious than somebody who devotes their life to to mathematics or the ballet uh perfectly perfectly serious business uh the 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 supreme practitioners of the art are people people to be held in high esteem uh where's 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 the problem uh i i uh i mean there, there is something odd about sport that makes it different from other things it's kind of doesn't connect up with other things in the same way as other aspects of our life. You know, our, our personal relationships, our jobs and uh, uh, our careers, uh, where's the money coming from, that they all tie together. And then kind of sport is up to a point off to the side. And uh, But maybe that's one of, its, one of its extra virtues. It means it's a way of taking time out, relaxing, not having to think about the things that are... That, uh, uh, eating away at you uh, I think you know, I, th I think that's a large part of sport for many people but but it, but it's it's not just a distraction I mean it's it, it's something that's valuable in itself I mean that's a, and I, I don't see any need to kind of defend that it seems to be kind of obvious uh, I, I mean, one one 
one way in this comes out is is the number of sports that just develop out of things that people are doing anyway uh so well, my favorite example is is rowing the oldest sporting event in the world is dogger's coat and badge from the uh 17th century in london in the thames there were a lot of there were a lot of watermen a lot of young men made their living rowing people and goods back and forth and the, of course they started to take pride in how good they were at rowing and so, so, of course they started to want to, to test themselves against each other and so there's something that starts off as a as a practical kind of activity uh quickly becomes an end in itself it's absolutely natural to humans to want to want to see how good they can be at something yeah well, I think I you, you quoted a philosopher in, in the book. Yeah. You, you quoted so, a philosopher in the book who said that, you know, at the end of the day, after uh, all of our material needs will be more or less satisfied automatically, right? The only thing left will be will be uh, games, right? And that, that games uh, with arbitrary rules, that'll, that'll be ultimately the, the most meaningful thing that we have because th- there will be nothing else. Um, but but you, dis- you distinguish between kind of games – and and sport right that, that yeah. there are sports that that don't have these arbitrary rules that don't involve mm-hmm. competition even and then there are um games that, that don't count as as sport and this i remember you know we have here a, a sports channel in the u.s uh i think you know espn and Right. And it's expanded away from just, you know, football and baseball. Now we have like, well, cheerleading, which of course is a physical activity, but you mentioned like championship barbecue and, you know, as somebody who likes to cook, I'm like, yeah, that, that sounds like a sport, you know, uh, that sounds meaningful to me, but what about, you know, bridge and, and chess? I mean, ESPN? are those sports? Do they have a barbecuing on ESPN? I, I don't know if it's on ESPN. I don't, I don't know what's it, but you know, we've got, um, master shit. We've got these like chef competitions, right? Where, you know, you have a half hour to crank out some kind of recipe and, you know, I don't know if I can cover them all. I mean, they're all, they're all covered in my, <laughs> in my book. I don't count. I mean, the, 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 the question is where does the line drawn between, okay. Chess doesn't come into it. Bridge doesn't come into it. They are not. They are not sports because sports involve physical excellence, and so uh, they they don't they don't get in. But but darts and pool, uh, I'll count them as sports have physical excellence. And then one kind of problem case is what about? Uh, I mean, in Britain we have the Great British Bake Off gets viewing figures of. I don't know, fifth of the population the final i mean and uh and and, and now we have a pottery and uh, uh sewing and you have barbecuing and uh, uh and those i won't count as sports not because they don't involve physical skill because they do but the physical skill is not the main part of it i mean you're judged on mm. the product how good is the cake nobody's looking to see how deftly you're putting on the icing and giving you marks for that. So so I think there's a fine distinction there between the... Uh, if you had a bricklaying competition, I mean, I think they do have bricklaying competitions. Oh, they, they do have... They I think they do have that. They do have uh, yeah. dry wall building competitions in exactly. Wales, right? Uh, but I'd say... Well, look, if, if, the, if the judges come along and examine the wall carefully to make sure it's all kind of nicely pointed and so on, then I say it wouldn't be a sporting competition. You're you're being judged on the product. If there's kind of, you know, rough rules about how good the wall have to be, and then it's just how fast you can do it within those rules, and nobody comes and examines how good the wall is at the end, then 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 they're they're evaluating your physical physical skill. Uh, mm-hmm. But let me say something else about the book and philosophy and sport how i got into it was not was not a matter of coming along and saying look here we can apply some philosophical techniques and say some interesting things about sport it was just the opposite way round uh i was worried about a philosophical problem and i started looking to sport as a kind of special case that gave us data about the philosophical issue that you couldn't get elsewhere i mean the issue was to do with uh, 
how far our actions are under conscious control. So uh, maybe when I'm, I don't know, I'm filling in the crossword, I'm it's under conscious control, but when I drive to work along a familiar route, it's not under conscious control. And And then I started worrying about how these two things interacted i mean if you're doing something out of habit uh uh is it completely independent of your conscious control and I, then i started thinking about about athletes where there often just isn't any time for consciousness to intrude if you're a baseball batter i mean you've got less than half a second the truth is there isn't even enough time for the information to get into your eye, through your visual cortex and down to your motor cortex. Something else is going on. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the, probably the, 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 the guiding of the hands is subcortical. You're probably reading an awful lot of information out of the, the pitcher's hand and angle before they let the ball go. But whatever, I mean, the, the, there's no conscious control involved. It's, it's, it's a reflex. But at the same time, the pitcher, the, the batter can, can set themselves. It depends what the, what the count is, what, what kind of strategy they're going to use i mean are they going to swing if it's on the edge or not and uh and they decide that beforehand and then this automatic reflex is controlled by the earlier decision and uh, how does all that work and and you don't get that kind of focusing of the issue that something which can only be a reflex is somehow being controlled by an earlier conscious decision uh, you don't get that issue kind of posed so clearly outside the sporting context with fast reaction sports. Fast reaction sports are very, very interesting about how the human mind works and how it controls actions. I mean, that seems metaphorical for, you know, life in, in general, right? So, yeah. you know, in judgment decision-making, we talk about, you know, system one, system two, Quite. but, and most of our actions are, are, are done, you know, more or less automatically. They're, 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 they're not done with a lot of reflection, but, the the reflection that that happens prior to that can can shape the the response function right so it's i mean it's it's not the same as reflex right reflex is 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 something that you know you can't more or less train reflex, but the, but these these a bit, a bit you can't retrain your reflexes you can't train yourself not to blink if somebody sticks a stick at mm -hmm. your arm uh perhaps reflex is to but conditioned response. I mean, something that uh, there's a stimulus, you do it. Uh, uh, look, many of my philosophical colleagues would say that if you're acting purposefully, attention, uh, intentionally, you know, your eyes are open, you're awake, then your consciousness is playing a controlling role all the time. And that was the idea I wanted to resist by saying in these uh, uh, fast sporting contexts, there just isn't any time. I mean, look, Roger Federer, sets himself to hit to uh, Nadal's backhand uh, when the opportunity arises. But the opportunity arises, I mean, the ball's coming at him uh, at 140 miles an hour. And uh, so how is his intention controlling the, the response? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with you about you know, a lot of it is system two and I mean system one and system two can control it but how does it control it and it doesn't control it by real-time monitoring because in the sporting context there isn't any time for the real-time monitoring that that was the thing that interested me yeah there's a great example which I, I've told I, I, I mentioned just to people in passing the last couple of days is uh, you cite this example where they took these female uh, softball pitchers and had them pitch to the uh world-class top flight baseball hitters and they and they, they whiffed completely and so you know uh, uh, presumably like a fairly decent high school softball player could mm -hmm. you know out hit the, the the world's best baseball hitters and it's not mm -hmm. because the you know the ball's traveling faster because it's not it's because the it's not about watching the ball at all it's about mm -hmm. the the preparation and and what they pick up on with respect to the yeah. the wind up right of the of the ball and this is so unfamiliar to them i, I love that example yeah yeah so there's a story which i'll tell you now which in fact didn't get into the book i don't quite know why 
But I have a friend, another philosopher of my generation, uh, Graham MacDonald. When he was young, he was a world-class squash player, top, top half dozen. I mean, he was in rank number five or something. But he described a case where he, he played when he was a youngster. He played the number one player and, and beat him. And the number one player said, well, right, OK, you beat me this time, but now I've played you and uh, we'll see how it goes uh, next time. Next time the, <laughs> the senior player won. And it was just he'd learned how to anticipate where the ball was going from Graham's movements. First time round, he didn't, he didn't know. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's all to do with the set of your wrist and your, uh, your shoulder and, and, and so on. And uh, people learn where the ball's going. I mean, I mean, there are experiments where they... They turn off your vision uh, before the ball mm -hmm. is let go. And uh, in quality sports, uh, the athletes uh, still do pretty well at, I mean, maybe not hitting a baseball, but knowing roughly where it's going to be. Uh, yeah. Right. And so you, you, you challenge this uh, uh, kind of y yoga theory of sport, right? Um, now, there's a whole literature on, you know, the yips and, and on choking, right, which yeah. says that, you know, if you're thinking too much, you're, you're, you're going to, you're, you're not going to perform. And so they draw the inference that, you know, high, high level skill is, is a function of not thinking, right? And so, mm -hmm. so, you know, what, what, what are they missing? Like, what are they, what are they getting wrong with that? And what, well, what's right about it? And, and what's wrong about it? What's right about it is, is you shouldn't try and control your movements in a active game. Uh, I mean, that's something you can do when you're when you're practicing. But if you start thinking, "Oh, I'm my back lift is too short," or uh, "I've got to speed up my putter head," uh, it will all go completely completely wrong. You you mustn't think about about your movements. You must leave that to your training. But where, where I think the the yoga people uh, go with the flow, just 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 do it, go completely wrong, is in drawing the inference that you should just empty your mind. And uh, and the truth is, I think you really have to focus on your game plan, on what you're trying to achieve. Like I said then that, that Federer might might have set himself to hit to Nadal's backhand and. Uh, uh, and he needs to keep that in mind and kind of set his program. This is the program I'm pursuing. And I mean, I, I like to think of it in terms of programs. I, mean, I, I think these top athletes have a bunch of different programs, routines that they have mm -hmm. have learned. And then and then in the context, maybe even between points, but at the beginning of the match, uh, they, they kind of decide which program they're going to to carry out this is the right mm -hmm. strategy. And then they have to hold that in mind, because if they don't hold it in mind, uh, the body will forget what's supposed to be controlling it. I mean, you, uh, I, I don't know if, 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 if you, uh, compete at all in any, any, any sports, but even at my level, I know that if, if you start daydreaming, you stop playing properly. I mean, you've, I mean, you've yep. just got it. If anything, you've just got to focus on, you know, hit the ball where my opponent doesn't want it hit and, uh, keep that in mind. You, you, you're not just stroking the ball around and, and it's all too easy to, 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 for your mind to lose control of your body in that way and, and, and start, start daydreaming. Mm -hmm. And then you're, then you're not, you're not focused. I mean, and of course this is obvious. I mean, uh, uh, despite the fact that, that, that there are these kind of uh, people who say what you need to do is empty your mind and just allow flow to go. All athletes know you've got to, you've got to focus, you've got to concentrate. Uh, uh, you've got, you've got yeah. To I mean, it seems like that, 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 that applies in domains, outside of sport as as well right i mean it seems if you're trying to undertake any kind of complex activity the performance is a function of the extent to which you can you know partition the 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 thought process between mm -hmm. you know the automatic and the the non-automatic and even even like within an organization Right, understanding what needs to be kind of a, a, a rinse, wash, repeat routine, and and what needs to be continuously, uh, you know, intentionalized. I mean, that that seems that seems that you you could extend that well beyond sport, right? Yeah, but I think in sport, in 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 when you're really competing, 
there's not really much that can be led to unmonitored routine. I mean, there's a difference between, mm. I mean, even somebody who's, I don't know, doing the vaulting horse in gymnastics mm. or the, the 100 meter sprint, uh, there's a level of focus and intensity in competition that you can't reproduce every time in practice. Mm. And if you don't have in mind, now we're competing, What's to tell your body that you're not in practice mode? I mean, you've got to you've got to gear things up and keep them there. I mean, there's a nice story about Pete Sampras. I think the time he was going to break the record for winning Wimbledon, and then they said to him, "What what were you were you thinking about when uh, you were approaching the the victory?" And he said, "I wasn't thinking about anything. Uh, my mind was empty." <laughs> but I don't think mm-hmm. that means that he's just relaxed and going with the flow. I mean, it's not like he's daydreaming. It's like he's thinking about absolutely nothing except hit the ball there, hit it there, hit it there. That's all he's thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, you talk about people who develop the yips and and, uh, wind up having to leave the profession. But you also talk about how uh, one type of of gamesmanship might involve... Mm -hmm. Uh, trash talking and uh, you know disrupting somebody's ability to 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 think clearly and 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 this this bled into a discussion about the kind of the the ethics of it um, and and you know just like in your uh, the one the philosophy book that you edited I think pretty much every vertical of philosophy is is touched on in in this book uh, and when you're talking about the trash talking it reminded me uh, of that famous scene you know where Jadon um, you know head-butted the, the Italian player, I forget his name, during the, I guess it was 2006 um, Serena, World Cup. I can't remember. Sad incident. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and of course, it was sad, but then, but of course, he defended himself and said, oh, you know, he, he said something about my, my mother or my sister or my wife or whatever. And, 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 and so the question is, okay, well, does that make it okay, right? I mean, is there, is there a, a level, is there a point, is there a type of... Is there is there a, a, a rule of conduct around this trash talking, you know, where y- you should not go? So I, I say quite a lot in the book about different codes of fair play in different different sports. And so I don't think, by and large, that there's an absolute standard about these things i mean there's some sports where and maybe more so in the past where where it wasn't acceptable to say anything to kind of distract your opponent and then there's sports where it's acceptable i mean you, you know everybody knows you might you might get inside somebody's head a bit but that's part of the game but you're allowed to make jokes and make certain kinds of comments but you aren't supposed to be talking you know making uh, uh, comments disreputable comments about their wives or or mothers and uh so and the way i think about it is is that these conventions which vary from sport to sport are like a kind of contract a deal this is how we're going to do it mm-hmm. and somebody who then breaks the contract they're behaving immorally but within the contract in many sports certain kinds of uh, trash talking uh, jokes that's acceptable and you can you know can do it more or less cleverly uh but i also say in the book that right now while there's plenty of room for different conventions different arrangements about what's going to be acceptable there's also some arrangements that aren't acceptable by anybody's standards and uh mm-hmm. It's not. It's uh, it's subjectively immoral, and I suspect that certain kinds of uh, comments about people's wives and mothers should be kind of considered off limits in any kind of context. I mean, Z- Zidane, uh, he's an experienced player, and you know he's going to meet that kind of stuff. And and my own view is is that quite a lot of of modern soccer. Is beyond the pale. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's straight into objective immorality, and the talking, also the you know the, the play acting to get other players into trouble. I, I that that just doesn't seem seem right to me. 
Zidane, uh, he'd been having a very frustrating time on the pitch. I mean, he was kind of being marked out of it. He, uh, we were into extra time, weren't we? The game wasn't won. Uh, mm. I think he was just getting more and more more frustrated. But it was it was surprising to see somebody of his stature get get mm. caught out like that. Uh, well, I mean, you, you talked about how if if you fail to take advantage of these things, then, you know, you may be le letting your, your team down, right? And, you know, I had a previous podcast interview where I talked to a management professor who um, was dismissive of uh, the people who say that, you know, flopping is um, in, in some way a, a, uh, a, a violation of good sportsmanship. Um, and, and he argued that, look, if, if it's, if it's permitted, then, you know, you got to do it, right? <laughs> Otherwise you're, you're not serious about winning. Um, and so you had some interesting comments about, um, the, the extent to which you should, you know, push the rules and, uh, and do it, do whatever you can get away with. So there's obviously incentives for the players to engage in a race to the bottom and it becomes by my counting the conventions have become immoral should we i mean what's to be done about it i mean do we look to the players themselves to stop doing it i mean the truth is you want you want the authorities to put some measures in place to make it uh, costly for the players to do it and and uh so should we blame the players if they're behaving immorally when nobody's stopping them? Uh, difficult, nobody letting the side down. But still, I mean, uh, even I'm sure even your your laissez-faire professor would agree that in some contexts there should be penalties for bad enough behaviour. I mean, what's the most... Uh, it was the Saints' bounty gate? I mean, it turned out that... Uh, uh, they were paying players to injure the opposition. Okay. And notice when that came out, mm -hmm. nobody said, oh, it's all right because everybody else is doing it, which was probably partly true. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd be letting the side down if we didn't. Uh, everybody could see, no, that's just not acceptable. Uh, even if everybody's doing it, it needs to be, it needs to be stamped out. So, uh, uh, I, I mean, I do think, you know, even in sports, and even given the flexibility to con conventions, there there's some things that are too far. Uh, I mean, drugs. Why, drugs, why is it? Why is it taking some sports? about drugs. Why is it? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say drugs. Why is it in some sports that, that? Yeah, why is it in some sports? It's it's seen as you know clever if you can um, you know hoodwink the the umpires and the referees, mm -hmm. and and yeah. in other sports, it's it's seen as uh, distasteful. So that's just that's just the conventions. That's just the agreements of the sport. I mean, the, the sports vary so much in their agreements. Uh, I mean, soccer has all kinds of of looseness and bad behaviour. But one thing you absolutely are not allowed to do is hit somebody else. But in hockey, right? In your ice hockey. That's kind of part of the game. Everybody loves it. You know, the two players go at each other and uh, uh, that's supposed to happen. And uh, except up to limits, they aren't allowed to use their sticks, are they? They're allowed to hit each other. I, I can't quite remember what, what the convention, but so, so there's, you know, there's, there's, there's conventions and conventions. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's like, you know, in, 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 in the West, you shake hands when you meet somebody. In in Japan, you bow. I mean, there there are different understandings of what what uh, constitutes respectful behaviour. And uh, I'm just trying to think. In American sports, are there cases where you're expected to call fouls on yourself? I mean, golf. I mean, uh, uh, mm. your. I mean, golf is pretty extreme in this respect, but. You know, if if the ball moves after you've addressed it and touched your club on the ground, uh, uh, you're not allowed to kind of pretend it didn't happen. You've got to call the ref and say that something happened, and I, I don't know quite the rules are. But yeah. but if somebody a golfer is caught out doing it on television, it won't be oh, uh, 
uh, they were being clever, bad luck, they didn't get away with it. Just opposite. It will be that they're, 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 mm -hmm. uh, uh, they lack moral fiber. I mean, uh, so. Well, in the, after the, after the most recent Super Bowl, there was uh, a player who, the determining play at the end of the game, the, there was a player on the Philadelphia Eagles who was uh, called for holding. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, after, after the game, they asked him what he thought. And he said, well, you know, I was holding. <laughs> I just thought it wouldn't, it wouldn't get called. And, and, yeah. and I remember people were equally divided where half people were saying, oh, this is, you know, refreshing honesty. And then there were other people who were saying, you know, why would you ever admit to that like shouldn't you say oh i was robbed and i shouldn't have been called and and <laughs> right um well, but, you but didn't uh, have any, any particularly the people particularly people who are fans of the team they said hey don't say that yeah uh, but that's one thing don't right. say it but that's just how you're supposed to behave in front of the media but you, you you didn't report any people as saying he shouldn't be doing it that it's not part mm -hmm. of the game to try and hold and hope the umpires don't 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 blow you up on it. I mean, of course, it's part of the game. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's perfectly obvious that in many sports, you're you're supposed to, it's part of the game that that, that you're supposed to uh, uh, do something which uh, might be against the rules and hope the umpires don't notice. I mean, uh, look, the case I love is, is framing the pitch in baseball. And uh, uh, I mean, this is considered, you know, very high level elite skill that the best and most honest baseball players practice, which is to fool the umpire in, into thinking it's a strike when it wasn't. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of weird. I mean, the, you're really trying to do something that, that disguises from the umpire that, that your pitcher has sent a bad pitch down. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just the well, I mean, case. A school convention. I mean, I mean, nobody goes around saying, "No, Buster Posey, you should have said it. You should have told the umpire it wasn't a strike. You knew it wasn't a strike." I mean, it's not part of the game. Well, I think in the you know it's the first week of law school. You take a torts class and you learn the difference between sort of an intentional tort, right, where you know uh, if you if you kick somebody under their desk in school and they have. Uh, like an eggshell leg and the, the leg collapses, well, you know, you're going to be liable for the, the damages. But the minute you step out into the field for recess, then, you know, if you kick somebody and something bad happens, it's, well, it's there, it's okay, right? Because everybody understands that when you're doing recess out in the field, you know, diff different rules apply. Um, and it seems like the, the same could be said about, you know, conversations, right? You know, there's going to be conversations where, people their their emotions are going to be negatively affected and and um and then you know conversations where you know that's okay and conversations where that's not okay right so for instance in in the classroom i think we've seen over the last yeah decade so, or so a change it's kind of obvious enough that i mean there's also the the, the variation from culture to culture but yeah you know, Formal occasions, less formal occasions, uh, with your friends, with your family, uh, things that are acceptable in one context and not acceptable in another context. And it's, it's a matter of what, I mean, largely a matter of what the expectations are. You could imagine the expectations being different and things would work fine. But given what the expectations are, you don't want to offend or upset people by by violating them. We, we need some set of expectations so people know how to conduct themselves but alternative alternative sets would work just as just as well i mean mm -hmm. i mean this is a general point now, about, now when you about conventions and morality I mean, we, we need some set of rules in order to uh, have all kinds of things that we benefit from and enjoy but exactly which set of rules we have uh, doesn't matter too much up to a point Right. And do you think that people um, fail to make that distinction in, in ordinary in ordinary life? I mean, th there are qu quite a few rules that we have devised in society that exist mainly to facilitate coordination and because we think that they will I improve the quality of life or so. But but I think that, you know, for many people, they 
have to imbue it with some kind of uh, you know, moral um, authority in order for them to 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 really accept the 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 rule. Well, it's complicated. It is a moral matter to me. If once you have the rules in place, that you should respect the rules, because if you don't, then you're disrespecting the people involved. Mm -hmm. So that's true. What's done is to think that people who have different sets of rules from you are per se immoral. That's like thinking Japanese aren't polite because they don't shake hands. Uh, but, I mean, you get this in sport a lot. I mean, uh, the, the soccer case is difficult because I think some of the soccer behavior really is just beyond the pale. But you you, you can imagine uh, uh, tennis fans looking down on hockey because, look, they start brawling all the time, aren't, aren't they vulgar ruffians? But I think that city is just that they've got a different set of conventions. Uh, uh, so... Yeah, so people often do do mistake what's uh, different conventions for being immoral. I think that's just a mistake. That's just uh, mm -hmm. insular. No well, I mean, there, there are people. There are people. There are people that brag about how they were able to, um, you know, cheat on their taxes. Let's say, and and they think they're 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 clever, right? Um, yeah. And there are others that will, will look at that and say, well, that's you know, that's a that's a that's a clear. Uh, violation of the of the social contract, right? Yeah, yeah. So I agree. I mean, and uh, it's an in, but well, it's an interesting question, and it will vary from place to place. What's part of the social contract? What's expected of people? And uh, yes, that's that's raising much more deep and difficult. Issues. So there's plenty of countries in which everybody expects you not to pay your taxes if you can. And I don't think in those countries it's really immoral not to pay your taxes. You do the way everybody else does. You probably a fine person upholding all kinds of standards in other areas of life. It's just that in this country, that's not what's part of morally expected behavior. I mean, having said that, I think it's sad for those countries. I think those countries uh, mm. get on less well than countries that have a different standard, different expectations of what's required of civil society. I mean, but now we're raising you know, much bigger and uh, more difficult, difficult issues. Uh, the, the kind of... Uh, Level of, level of expectation and trust we have in some some uh, advanced societies is a valuable thing. Not everybody, not all societies have it, and it's a, a difficult thing to build up, a very difficult thing to build up, and uh, I fear probably rather too easy to lose. But yeah. We're getting it. We're getting it. We're going, yeah, to, be it's about, we're going to be talking about sport, uh, uh, not the future of, of uh, advanced democracies. Well, well, you had some interesting points about fandom, right? Um, and uh, you know, I mean, it's when when people believe that when people support their team, right? They 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 feel that they if they didn't support their team, that they would be violating some some kind of, of of duty right but 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 it seems you know rather arbitrary right? you know why you would support one team versus another but the the fact even if you acknowledge that it's arbitrary that doesn't in any way dilute the the fervor with which one supports one's one's team i mean how, how do we how do we how do we how do we reconcile i mean is this just similar to you know, the duty that you have to your, your immediate family, which is necessarily going to be in conflict with universal moral norms. I mean, if you, if you're a Kantian, right. I mean, you'd have to be like, I don't care which team wins. Right. Um, and maybe you just say, well, that team played better. And so they won and therefore I support them. Right? I mean, that would be, that would, that would kind of destroy the, a lot of the, 
a, a lot of the fun of it, right? I mean, is yeah. is 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 this necessarily in, in conflict with some some fundamental uh, moral principles? I'm always amazed when people uh, actually pray to God to have their team win, and and it's yeah. like, well, the other side's doing that, so right? like everyone's praying to God for their team to win, right? God God doesn't have a, have a, have a dog in this fight, right? Yeah, uh, but I mean, I, I think it shows that 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 what's I mean, th there's some philosophers who are objectivist about values. What's valuable for one person should be valuable for everybody if you should behave differently towards your children than other children. It's not a matter of uh, your children being more valuable for you. It's a matter of you having a duty towards your children. You don't have towards other children. But I think that uh, that's too austere. And, and the fact of sports fandom gives the lie to it. I mean from many people's perspective, it's valuable that their team wins. Nobody should say they've got a duty to support their team. It's a matter of duty. It's just a matter of what what uh, colours the world in uh, in in uh, good technicolour uh, success for them. Uh, their team their team wins, and I just think we have to to recognise that that uh, what's valuable is different for different people, and. Uh, uh, this is a sore point. And my son is an Arsenal fan, and uh, and I'm a Tottenham fan, and <laughs> and we have season tickets. How did that happen? Uh, I tried to bring him up not to be an Arsenal fan. I'm from North London, but uh, uh, when I was young, Arsenal were a very boring boring team and uh i turned against them i, mean, I never was uh, uh, I'm a tottenham fan but when he was a youngster i tried to bring him up like that but one day he came home from school when he was about eight or nine he said dad i'm sorry i'm sorry but uh you know all, all, all you know the whole school were arsenal fans and he and he didn't mm -hmm. want to be uh one of them so and now he's a big arsenal fan last night was the last 16 of the uefa cup and i went to arsenal with him and uh, and uh, Arsenal lost in penalties. They got kicked out of the the competition. And uh, he went home very sad. And uh, and it's kind of it's not as bad as when Arsenal are playing Tottenham. When we go together, we know one of us is going to be sad. But uh, still, I you know uh, I can't quite share his pain. But uh, I'm empathetic. Well, I mean, is it is it is it, is it completely arbitrary, or do you think that there are maybe rules around what constitutes an acceptable loyalty? I mean, when I was growing up as a kid in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. if if someone came to school with a Cowboys jersey on, I mean, they would experience an enormous amount of of abuse, right? And uh, and and it was seen as unnatural, as seen as 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 traitorous in some way. Yeah. But but then when when Philadelphia fans moved to other parts of the country, they they raised their children as 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 Philadelphia fans, yeah. thereby you know well, if in most of the country that does not result in a substantial amount of abuse because most places are not as rabid and fervent as they are say in Philadelphia. But but yeah. um, but but if you're say that child, you you have a conflict between your parental uh loyalties and and maybe your your peer loyalties is is there it i mean i i'm always suspicious of people who root for a team simply because it's good um that that seems to me to be some fundamental betrayal of of of, of some other some other principle like like loyalty or or I filial mean, duty who, who, who knows uh it's a matter of accident. I mean, but you know, often it's just you know, my, my son. What's good, where, where you are, what all the people around you are, but also what your parents are. I was thinking, just myself. I don't know how normal this is. I find that there'll be some athletes that I kind of notice when they're starting and they're exciting, and then I'm gonna be a fan 
for the rest of their sporting lives. I want them to mm. do. I, I don't know. Is that general? Do you have the same thing? I mean, I, who was I thinking it with? Yeah. Well, Rory McEl Maury McElroy, you know, he, he nearly won the Masters when he was 19. He was a real phenom. And then, yeah, he's kept going. And mm -hmm. I always want him to win. And uh, I think Emma Redekana is going to be the same. And, and Otani, I mean, it's partly when you, if you, kind of pick them up before other people and they become your person and i you know i just want them every time they do well i you know i turn to the sports pages to see what their results were and uh yeah i don't know i guess that's natural yeah yeah you well, it's, I mean, it's interesting when a player when a player when a player leaves your team and joins another team right and then that team yes. competes against against your team yeah. um and, and you point out the difference between sort of a you know loyalty to a team versus uh you know loyalty to the the individual members of the team but but isn't a team just a you know as margaret thatcher said there's there are no teams there's just there's just individuals right how is it that we can be fans of a team over a long period of time where the the team membership is just completely replaced and churned and and you know becomes particularly puzzling when that churn gets faster and faster and faster and we now have a yeah. world where you know the players may only stay on the team for a year or two yeah and it's funny some players who leave when they come back they're like long lost sons that the, the fans love i mean uh i'm just trying to think of all the examples uh but others other other cases i mean sol campbell went from uh Arsenal to Tottenham and it was like that's traitorship I mean uh, and uh, he's not welcome back when he comes back uh, but other cases you know long-standing long-standing uh, loyal loyal players who go somewhere else at the end of their career then when they come back the fans love them and uh, so uh, yeah I mean, you become attached to 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 teams and to players but um yeah obviously for many people loyalty primary loyalties to a team not to players and uh it's still there even if the players have all turned over and uh mm -hmm. yeah well you know you reference also this thing called the uh what was it the the tip tip it test right uh and this was uh primarily around people who you know move maybe from one country to the next uh yeah. and here in the u.s right the that we have when the U.S. national team plays against the, the Mexican national team, yeah. we will often have more uh, fans of, of the Mexican team, right, <laughs> in, in attendance. Uh, and, uh, and at least in America, no, nobody thinks that they're, they're, they're unpatriotic. But, but this has been a problem, I think, in, in the U.K., right? Is that right? This is not an issue in, in America because... You scarcely have because any. no one takes soccer seriously. Yeah, exactly. But, but <laughs> no one takes soccer seriously. That's why. It's not that you're picking on. <laughs> in America plays uh, the states play Mexico, because the states don't play international sport. They don't play. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a bit of basketball, a bit of hockey, but the top players often just skip that. And so, for Americans playing sport against against other countries is not a big thing. I mean it doesn't really happen in America. I mean, I, I talk about that quite a lot in the, in the book. And uh, I don't think Americans are, are comfortable with international sport. They're not comfortable with the idea that, you know, they're in some competition with other countries that they might not win. Uh, I, 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 I well, we're America. comfortable when we, when we, when we're comfortable in, when we dominate, right? So when the dream team went to Barcelona in 1992, yeah. everybody was like, oh, this is great. This, this shows you, you know, it's like going to war against Grenada. It's uh, it's the way it's it's the natural state of things, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, in 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 the rest of the world where we do have international competition, and we do like the states have uh, a, 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 a now a multi multicultural society, it's an interesting issue, and uh, and I regard it as rather narrow minded to insist that that everybody who's uh, a loyal citizen of Britain or England, that there's already a problem, Britain or England, which are two different entities with different sporting loyalties, uh, uh, to regard, require everybody who's a British citizen to 
support the British team against, say, the Indian team. I mean, uh, of course, a lot of lot of uh, 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 British citizens of Indian ancestry are, are yeah, they're heroes of the Indian cricketers, and why not? And why not? Uh, 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 my view is 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 that uh, citizens owe owe certain. Uh, Things work best if citizens uh, respect certain features of their home society, but it doesn't require excluding other other attachments and loyalties. There's no reason why they shouldn't be be overlapping uh, uh, commitments to different different countries. Uh, well, you, you you introduced this notion of um, you talk about kind of. I, I forget the term. It's kind of like team thinking, right? And and it's impossible. To, so I teach a course on game theory, and oh, yeah. okay, um, cool. and when we teach game, yeah, when we teach game theory, right? I mean, it's all built on this idea of individual rationality, and yeah. so um, oftentimes we get some puzzling empirical results when we when we have people, you know, play these games where oftentimes they'll 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 gravitate towards coordination very yeah. very quickly even though it's it's only one of many equilibria uh, and right. and you say well that's because they're they're kind of switching on their their hey we're we're maximizing for team now right. company managers are always wishing right they want their employees they wish that their employees would kind of automatically jump right. into this so do you think that this this i this you know this this idea of of you know thinking of yourself as part of a team is is this a switch that that you can turn on or off? Is this a is, well, what is it that that you know? What are the conditions that w are most likely to lead people to 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 think team first? I don't think it's very hard to turn that switch on. Uh, I'm curious about how how this works in uh, management. Uh, business uh thinking but look one thing i'd want to argue against the real hardline individualist economists who say everybody just is doing the calculations for themselves maximizing their own utility is look it's pretty obvious that that's not how people think in an awful lot of contexts in an awful lot of context there's a bunch of people and they've got some problem and it's clear they address it as what should we do and uh, what's the best joint set of actions we can perform mm -hmm. and and uh, it might pan out that that you as one of this team is going to have to perform some actions which aren't really the ones that you would have chosen for yourself, but you're committed to doing what's best for the team. I mean, in, in uh, uh, suppose it's just an amateur sports team, so we don't have any managers or money involved. And uh, right, you all sit down with how are we going to beat this other side? And right, so you, you Jim, had better just man mark their player, their star player out the game. It's going to be a very boring game for you, and uh, everybody can see this is the right solution. And so you do it. I mean, uh, it. it Families deciding where to go on holiday. Uh, you know, now they aren't thinking. You know, what's best for me, given what the others might choose? They just think, what's the best thing for for all of us? And it's it. And I don't see any reason to query whether this is. I mean, this is clearly as natural for human beings. And if you want to think about the evolution of our psychologies, it's just as likely to evolve. As thinking of individuals, I mean, think of small hunter-gatherer groups going out to catch a catch a bison or something. I mean, they got to think what's what's the best way for us to catch a bison. And uh, uh, so it's very natural for humans. Now, now, of course, you don't think like that in all contexts. I mean, if you and somebody else are sitting in the room waiting for an interview for a job, I mean, you uh, you're you're competing, and it would be right and natural for you to to think competitively so there's some context in which you think competitively as an individual other contexts in which you think as a team but it's very natural to think as a team and there's nothing psychologically odd about it there's nothing from the point of view of rationality odd about it and uh and yeah sure you want your uh your marketing department to think as a team you don't want them to think as competing individuals and uh mm -hmm. but look you work in a university. I mean, so in our country, university departments tend to get 
ranked on various, I mean, how good are you as a teaching institution? How good are you at research? And and we all worked like mad as a team to you know, to get up the rankings, to get the department up the rankings. It's not, I mean, and you know, I'm really pleased when I, my department's up the rankings because because I'm part of that department. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not hard to get people to think as a, a team. Uh, well, when I when I do my game theory, I I, I do I spend a, a week on this game called the OPEC game, where the each of the student right. teams is assigned a country and they have to you know produce oil and and I've done this in two ways. Once I had um, just you know seven teams representing seven countries, and then you know sometimes if I have a large enough student body, I'll split them into two separate worlds where there's seven teams over here representing seven countries. And then over here I have seven teams representing the same seven countries and they all interact with each other. And I always get more cooperation when I have these two teams, because I remind them that there's, there's another universe over there that they're competing against, you know? So, so it seems like, it seems like, you know, competition seems to be uh, a a very important way of, of stimulating team cooperation, right? I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. I mean, it's it's clearly not necessary for team thinking. I mean, you know, a group of friends trying to figure out where to go for a night out. They're not in competition, but but I can see that that it, it uh, might well be sufficient. I mean, it might well be a good way of prompting prompting team thinking. Uh, and yes. So it comes naturally. I mean, it comes naturally to your, your even even your economic students to. to, to yeah, they, they they realize. Yeah, once that once once they're being compared to to some <laughs> some other group, that's when they the the, the cooperative um, impulse kicks in. And you had some great. You were talking about cycling, and I had not yet. I had I hadn't appreciated the the complexity of of, of cycling, and and yeah. it made me gain an appreciation, and and I wanted to go out and, and study it more. Um, yeah. But I, I wanted to, there's, there's so much more in this book on sport we could talk about, but I just want to, before we wrap up, um, I want to talk about this book right here, Philosophical uh, Devices. And yeah. I mean, this is a, this is, this is really a wonderful book and it's incredibly concise and it, it covers a, a lot of, a lot of territory. Um, and when you started off the book, you said, this is sort of, uh, these are, these are sort of, you know, the essential bits of, 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 philosophy and and you contrasted them actually with a course on formal logic now i remember taking a course on formal logic one in my beginning my education and and i always thought this is something that you know everybody should get at some level maybe not at quite the level that i got but everyone should be exposed to formal logic everyone should be exposed to what we might think of as 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 rhetoric or critical thinking Mm -hmm. how how universal do you think, how broad do you think, I mean, this is for philosophy majors, but, but how, how, how broad do you think the insights and the, the points in a book like this should be, um, should, how broadly should it be, be taught? I mean, should everybody who goes to university get exposed to some rudiments of, of philosophy like this? So that, that book was specifically motivated by thoughts of philosophy student readers. And the reason I wrote it is because British philosophy departments generally, they don't do, they don't do critical thinking courses, but they, I mean, and that book is not as, as, as you know, critical thinking. It's, it's quite mm-hmm. assy and technical, uh, but they do do a formal logic course. And so they'll do the, Propositional calculus and the predicate calculus. Our students at King's uh, would spend a quarter of their first year doing the logic course, and uh, similar in, in many other British universities. And and I thought this was unnecessary. I mean, it, it becomes a lot of kind of techniques you learn, and it's kind of for a lot of the students. In fact, for all the students, I mean, some of them can learn the techniques. Some of the kind of, but they, they, nobody ever told them what was the philosophical point of it very much. It wasn't like a critical thinking course. It was a kind of technical course. And I had thought for a long time, 
there's all this kind of techy stuff I know as a professional philosopher because I've had to kind of figure it out. Mm -hmm. But I did have to figure it out, and nobody told me. And I wish somebody had just told me. I mean, there's all these kind of massy results that are really interesting. And if you're a kind of third year, fourth year master's philosopher, you're supposed to know about it. But there's no easy way of finding it out except doing these technical courses. And uh, I I say in the preface to the book that uh, I explained to one of my logic colleagues what I was going to do in the book. And he said, he said, but you're just picking all the plums. <laughs> I, he meant mm -hmm. his students had to plow through eight weeks, 10 weeks, 15 weeks of boring exercises before they got to something that was kind of conceptually interesting and i said that's exactly what i want to do i want to i want to just mm -hmm. pull out the conceptually interesting bits from all the 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 boring exercises you make them go through and so so the book does uh set theory and uh infinities and russell's paradox and then it does some stuff about a priori and a posteriori and then it does probabilities and causes and then it does some Gödel's theorem kind of stuff. And should everybody do something like that? I don't know. But it but it was absolutely what the philosophy students needed. And uh, I'm not mm -hmm. sure whether people have actually started changing the syllabus to. I mean, I, I know that there's some courses based on 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 the book, but I think a, a lot of people tell their students go go and read this book. It's 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 going to give you a whole lot of stuff that you aren't going to get easily elsewhere. Uh, what do you think? Do you think, do you think everybody should be, be taught Russell's paradox? And, uh, uh, well, I, I, I think, I think it's much better than, than taking three years to get to it. Right? it so I think it, it basically makes it more accessible so that people can take one or two philosophy courses and they don't have to do two or three years to, to get to the, absolutely. some of the key concepts. No, it's 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 kind of fun. I mean, in, so let me just tell you. In, in this book, I do I do uh, Russell's paradox and set theory, and then I do orders of infinity and denumerable and non-denumerable numbers, and then I do the continuum hypothesis and I do the generalized continuum hypothesis, and that's the first three chapters. And then there's three chapters like that on a priori and a posterior, and three chapters like that on uh, uh, correlations and probability and causation. And then there's three chapters on the nature of logic and uh, syntax and semantics, logical systems. And then I sketch a proof of Gödel's theorem. And that's all in this book that is what? I mean, it's uh, 150 pages, uh, 50,000 words. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a fat book. And I, I think I do all that stuff pretty properly you know i i explain it all and i but i don't go through all the technical details i as i say i pick the plums so yeah. well now this new book on causation um i think causation is something that pretty much every social scientist needs to grapple with i mean yeah. every every scientist of every kind needs to, to grapple with it um but but it seems like causation is something that that uh, you know we we kind of we, we kind of assume that we know what it is and, and we kind of, um, you know, push that problem under the rug and get on with the, with the business of, of, of science. Uh, what would be the goal of, of your, of your book on causation? Is there, is there a way that we can get everybody who's a, a scientist, particularly a social scientist to, um, you know, grapple with, with the, the, the key aspects of causation? I want, look, I think, For philosophers, I think there's a a glaring challenge. I think that there's a bit of a scandal that philosophy is not addressing this challenge. I mean, I, I'm kind of in a hurry to write this book because I think it's such an obvious thing to be doing. I'm worried other people are going to be doing it too. Perhaps I shouldn't be uh, advertising on your podcast what the project is. But but here's 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 the setup. Uh, in philosophy, people theorize about causation. What's the nature of causation? And they have various philosophical theories involving 
counterfactuals and powers and laws and so on. And and then over there in the statistics and econometrics and sociometric departments and uh, computer science departments, there are people developing techniques of causal inference, which basically take as input information about correlations, about probabilistic dependence, and then there's various techniques, and at the end comes uh, uh, you know, reducing taxes causes more uh, employment, uh, smoking causes cancer, uh, private schools don't really improve exam results, and so all kinds of uh, causal conclusions. And the thing that has grabbed me is that the philosophical analyses give us no clue whatsoever to why these correlational techniques work. And what I want to do is try and develop a philosophical analysis of what causation is, the metaphysics of causation, the nature of causation, that explains why you can find out about causes by looking at these complicated uh, conditional unconditional correlations. And, uh, and nobody's really uh, attacked this problem very hard. I mean, there the, the are philosophers who are interested in the correlational techniques, but they tend to be pretty techy and uh, they don't really want to get involved in the the metaphysics of causation, nature of causation. Then the pure philosophers who do the metaphysics of causation don't know about all statistical stuff. And uh, I think it's a bit of a scandal. It's a bit of a scandal that, that the <laughs> philosophical theories of causation cannot explain why the causal inference techniques work. And, uh, but as uh, I'm finding... It's quite a challenging project because the statistical stuff is pretty mathematical, pretty well worked out. Lots of lots of theorems you can prove, and I don't want this to be a book uh, more more theorems and statistics. I want this to be a book mainly aimed at the philosophical audience, saying, "Look, here's stuff that you really need to know about, and you need to be able to explain." But so I'm I'm saying in kind of philosophical terms, this is how it works, that's how it works. And then I think, hang on, am I really right about the the mathematical underpinnings here? I better see if I can prove this. I better, in fact, uh, I realize a better strategy is to go to somebody else who knows and say, can I prove this or how would I prove this? But uh, so it's proving quite, quite challenging on the technical level, but it's fun. Well, I certainly look forward to it, and I think a lot of economists will be interested um, in reading that new book. So maybe we can get you back on the show for that one. David, th thanks so much for joining me. Uh, this is the book we spent most of the time talking about. It's called Knowing the Score, What Sports Can Teach Us About Philosophy and What Philosophy Can Teach Us About Sports. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.